So AI has made a great entry today at SHAM. All the roundtables talk about it, and many uh, have it as, a, as its cent a central topic. It's a vector of hope, innovation, and progress. It's everywhere. It's ubiquitous in health. It's promising of corrections, optimization of the health system, even though it's hard to measure. And I, 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 I totally agree, uh, but it's hard to find a consensus. But it calls us on on the 42% of efficiency, inefficiencies, the, the wrong diagnosis, 10, 15%, according to the, to the publishings, the organizational flaws. So AI, we hope that it will help to heal better, to better care, to better prevent, to bring also better working conditions, practices for health professionals who are under pressure and to, increase, to improve their flow, their workflow. It will reduce mistakes and, and the deviations from, from standard norms and, and best practices by having uh, 24-7 available resources, better coordinated, and allowing for to answer to an, object, to an objective of reasoned consumption and contributing into our effort to decarbonate our system. And this is the, the object of, of our roundtable. The exponential uh, spreading of AI is in, be in between enthusiasm and worry. And so we have a roundtable more on the concerns that it raises, where concerns on the risks induced by lack of absence and, and con of, uh, control and manifest mistakes in the first uh, application of AI, which are ridiculed in, in caricatured many times, concerns on the misuse of AI, and globally, the effects on, of, of AI on our society, our civilization, and the, the concern on sacrificing the human and ethic uh, to technology. And so we are fortunate to have a, a, a table of a specialists that use design AI and who and who are going to bring their point of view of, of, of doctors panel. Uh, and experts in the domain in order not to be into the, the realm of fantasy but of reality in, in your practices. And so we're going to start with Stéphanie Alassonia, who is uh, here remotely uh, with an express lecture on the fundamental reasons for which AI is mechanically wrong because the fruits of a probabilistic uh, science. And so the, this approach, it, pro it makes probabilities. And with generative IA, it analyzes rather than, than it makes mistakes. So what you're going to tell us, Tiffany, is what margin of error can we, can we improve so that, so that the performance of AI is, is, is we get the most of it? Can we improve it to the point of getting rid of, uh, of sweeping away our, our concerns? Th thank you, Alex. Uh, so sorry not to be to be physically present today, but indeed I'm going to try to present to you what so that we will never get to a, 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 a zero mistakes to so human mistakes also will never get to zero. AI. There are two categories. There's symbolic AI and everything based on, on learning and apprenticeship. In both cases, you have models. So mathematicians offer a modelization of what can be observed in the data. And so in fact, from the moment that it's only a model, you, you get closer, you approach reality. And intrinsically, since it's a model, there will be mistakes, there will be errors. When you go into learning apprenticeship techniques, the second category, that also has the statistical statistical approach, the standard statistical approach, and and what is linked to deep learning. You have this part, this this learning uh, that you factor in the data, and you introduce a new source of error in the data. Do I have the information that is relevant in order to take a a decision, a decision. So the question I asked myself, based on this on this data, and so the question you have to ask yourself is. 
already in the data is there the information that will allow me to decide, to make a decision, what I wish to, to offer as a response. I'm going to give you a simple example. I'm going to modelize the size of the adult population as a mix of two Gaussian uh, curves with, with two bumps, one the size of so women and, and men population. And so evidently, with this only information, you're un unable, if I just give you the size of, of, of this person, if it's a man or a woman, prob the likelihood uh, I have X percent chance that it's a man or a woman, but you can never categorize it for sure because the answer is not in the data. What the mathematicians are trying to do is to understand the context of acquiring the data, collecting the data, what it what it transports in terms, what it brings in terms of information, and the quality. Quality in terms of, of is the figure that I see is correct, but not, not only that, is, is the information that I can extract from the data is relevant for the questions we ask. So, evidently, when you ask yourself this kind of question, the more you have data, the more you hope the answer is in the question. And so that's why the techniques that aggregate a lot of information per individual are more and more relevant because with the size, you can add weight, you can add a temp, a t a time information and other kinds of information. And so and gradually, you're going to separate better and better male from female population. Same thing for other issues. You're going to have the same, the same issues. Uh, that are going to be that are going to emerge if you ask from this uh, list of phenotypes. This fetus has has a rare disease, and I take this example because to show you that uh, AI manages to find solutions. The more we have data, and the more we accumulate uh, modelizations. The example of Sonio. So it's a startup that we co-founded with doctors from the maternity at Necker Hospital in Paris. And so it was to say, from a list of phenotypes, can we categorize early, as early as possible fetuses with, with, with a genet, rare genetic disease? A human brain from a gynecologist ob obstetrics standard. Well, good, skilled, 30, 40 known disease with everything that it entails, the phenotype, uh, prevalence of, of certain ten types con that condition disease, which is huge already. A real specialist is going to know maybe 60. But when you have AI helping you to to allows you to organize because we managed to modelize all the relations between the phenotypes and the diseases, then you can go up until 500 disease pathologies and diseases. And to help the human who is going to take the decisions. In, in the analysis of what he's going to do, because with all the phenotypes that you manage to, to, to type in and to factor in the, with the knowledge and the modelization that we brought, we will, we will be able to offer something that help, will help the practitioner to make a decision and to, to get it and to, uh, not to make mistakes. The quality of the data is key in the quality and the relevance of AI. Let's go around the table quickly. Where, at what point are we in the quality of data mobilized in practices and the use of AI? I don't know if you want to start briefly. I see two kinds. There are AI that is acquired automatically, uh, robustly. There are equipment like imaging, uh, histopathology, or genomics. This data is good quality because the modality in which we acquire, collect the data is deterministic, and everything that is clinical data based on human classifications, which are not as explicit and less formal, it's probably more difficult and less structured. Simple as that. It seems paradoxical that we have, we see, it seems that the simplest data are the most difficult to, to, uh, to exploit. There are studies that show that in, in, uh, in the storage of data, we have just copy and paste from, from the previous data. And so paradoxically, the most complicated data, gen genomics imagery, it's easier to, to exploit. And so we're thinking of methods. It's been time already of uh, NAP. 
to try to, to objectify and to use this clinical data that, in my sense, in our, in, is just going to give us the best, the best results in the end. And we suffer also from the partition between clinical data and medical economic data from the from the from the uh, health insurance, uh, and, and and so to have more sharing, in in a framework of confidence and trust to access this data to support development of AI. Arnaud, uh, you work in cardiology with the application uh, with direct uh, application of uh, of AI, which allows you to be more reliable and specific. But that's not the subject here. In any case, the question I, I had for you was, in the end, nevertheless, in spite of, of this reliability, added reliability, do we have new risks with AI that, 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 that troubles you in, in the way you deploy those solutions? Uh, more broadly speaking, in the application that we see, I would say that, to summarize, that there's two types of AI. There's productivity AI, we talked about it already, everything that allows to ease the work of the doctors, so it, 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 to the fact of sorting out data to look at electrocardiograms, is what we see in imaging AI, more conventional to help diagnosis. And then there's predictive AI, uh, AI that will try to anticipate uh, events for, with patients. And uh, we have data now that allow us to uh, assess uh, st uh, sterilization processes for cardiac patients. So the, the risks are not the same. And so the nature of this AI, productivity AI, is AI that targets, basically that aims at solving this issue of resources that we have. So doctors with too much data, and we, so tele uh, monitoring, so acquire, there's a lot of connected uh, objects, and and, we, and how do you review this data in, 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 in timely fashion, and to have medical efficiencies uh, as a consequence. The risks that it entails and that it creates if we replace all the doctors by automation, is it not as good or is it better? So in, in predictive AI, it's different. Uh, are your models efficient? But the nature of these algorithms, humans are not, don't have the, the ability to, 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 to measure up to that. So how do we reason in, med in medicine in general? Think of the context first. We don't reason, uh, is, it, is this AI risky or not? It's a, it's a question of cost opportunity. Can, can AI get it wrong? Yes. Then so it's not desirable. You, you show that humans in their functioning of, of medicine today get it wrong a lot in part part from from you know making mistakes because part of it's professionals and humans who who do the job you have the question the same patient with uh, the same data submitted to judgment of, a, of an expert of a specialist who has a theoretical knowledge and proper experience are we going to have the same treatment are we going to have the same prescription the same diagnosis no so the issue how do we assess? Do we have more benefits than risks with AI? And this is how we think in medicine. Do we increase, enhance the level of benefits, or do we do we do we mitigate the risks? And if this risk is still important, so Arno, you are a user of AI in your in your practice in oncology. <laughs> and so you live, uh, you see, uh, you experience this evolution in medical practice. This new wave, uh, it questions us, it, and we, we fear our dehumanization of, of medicine. And the question we have, the issue we have, when, it gets, when AI gets it wrong, uh, what do you see the future for, for, medicine, for, for doctors and the way doctors integrate AI in their practice? We have the impression there's a lot of fantasy uh, coming from the pop culture projected on the use of AI in medicine, the, the relation between the body and the machine. And I have the, the opposite uh, opinion. I have the intuition that AI, on the contrary, is going to rehumanize medicine. We ask the question often, patients uh, complain about the technicity of, of, uh, of medicine. That that's not new. It's since the 90s with the emergence of imaging and the power that it entails. And since this time, patients complain a lot a loss of, of human contact. And so this loss of contact is due to the technicity of medicine that increased 
compared to what we, we could do before. And so now we're in a period where technicity can be taken back by algorithms and, and AI in part, and so it will allow us to free human time to do the real job of the doctor, which is the relation with, with, with their patients. And so paradoxically, AI not only is not, I hope, not going to dehumanize things, but rehumanize things by freeing time. By freeing time, yeah. Yes, in oncology, in radiotherapy, we prepare treatments to, to tell the machine where it should send the, the beams. And, the radio, and it can take a, a couple of hours on a computer in Pompidou, where I, I work, where I practice. We have algorithms that allow to reduce this time to two, two, and three, two or three minutes. All this time is freed up and not be in front of your computer, but do the consultation and, and work on the relationship. Uh, yeah, if it's anticipated and thought of and thought through and done in that, in that sense. David Gruson, uh, you, uh, the potential of AI is infinite. Your fear, if I understood well, we, we fear that AI gets it wrong and that, and that we, uh, we would be wrong by trying to push it away. So both Arnaud and Jean-Minuel and Stéphanie has, has shown well uh, since 2017 uh, at Etikia and Hélène Marin, the, uh, we promote the idea that if we look at the, the ethical risks associated to AI, and they are, the loss of human control, delegation of, of decision making, the ethical, main ethical risk is not to open yourself to it. And this opposition, which is strong, which is, which is a reversed reading of the pre precaution principle. It's, the National Committee of Ethics uh, adopted it, uh, uh, their opinion uh, 129, following the recommendation that we had with many people present here. The CCNE took this position and, uh, uh, and repeated that same opinion. The main risks uh, of AI would be to push it away, because we have to measure that in an environment where digital in health uh, is broadened, the, the, the borders are porous, uh, and we, we should not be fooled. If we're not able to develop s French, European solutions in a context that is legally, ethically the most protecting in the world, our uh, citizens will turn to solutions designed elsewhere with an increased risk of exfiltration of our health data and loss of sovereignty. But the stakes of developing the, those tools in France in a logic of a positive regulation to invent methods of management methods and, and risk management methods that are credible but flexible is also an ethical uh, issue for the future of our health system. And so we understood we're all convinced that AI is part of, of the future of medicine and today's medicine. The issue of the risk of getting it wrong, making mistakes uh, with or without AI, it questions the legal system, responsibility issues as a consequence and regulation. In terms of responsibilities, what about of a doctor, what about a doctor who gets it wrong? with AI, Gener uh, does it change the medical responsibility? To talk about this question, we should understand that very schematically, there are two types of AI that are going to be used. One is already used is AI, which we use to do things that we can already do ourselves, typically reading of medical imaging, radio, MRI, scans, x-rays, and biopsy. In this domain, for now, even though we can we can accelerate things, there's always a, re, a human reading that is done uh, after. So, so the final decision doesn't change. Uh, the, the doctor is going to validate the, the, the final decision. Maybe in the future there will be less and less of that. And so the second type of AI are AI that allow us to do what humans that that humans cannot do anyway. Predict in advance your risk of having a disease, or if you already have a disease, your chances of, of healing. We know that research in neurobiology uh, beyond five factors, the human brain cannot is not good at making predictions. So we cannot check what AI does unless you make clinical trials over 10 years, then maybe we'll do that. But in this framework, there will be a loss of, of power. And the liability, the legal liability is much more questioned, whether it be shared between the doctor who, who does the treatment in the end, or is it the hospital who paid for the solution? Is it be the publisher, the editor? 
of, of the software? The, the, the responsibilities are not clear here. It's an open question. It's an open question on the issue of, responsibility, of medical responsibility. What brings us to the evolution of regulation? You told us right now that, David, that you pleaded uh, for the human guarantee of AI. So maybe you should explain to us in into more detail what it means and to take care uh, of, of preserving our innovation capacity. Could you tell us, in, in summary, what is, what is in the AI Act and what is moving in this field? So thank you. In the end, this principle of human guarantee it, 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 it came from reflections uh, in Sham. It's right here at Sham. Uh, uh, did you ask for royalties on that? I, I, th I think we can we can we can really uh, salute and hail that uh, that that work because this play, what we have ideas flowing here and we have principles that evolve through time. And so the, the, the principle of human guarantee, like a Pokemon, he works, he evolves through time. It's the same principle, but he gets gets stronger with time, keeping human at the center of the mechanism, and Emmanuel showed it pretty well, keeping a human decision and, and supervision, monitoring uh, technologies. So it was included in Article 17 of the bioethics uh, law. Uh, so the law of, of uh, August 2020, information of the patient on resorting to AI in in the in the, the procedure. The CCNE recommends collegial supervision, the, the, the uh, college uh, guarantee with quality of risk management. We're going to sample, review cases with representative of the professionals and patients. What we developed, we have 12 ecosystems in place. The first. In, in dental care, radiology, yesterday with the teams of Sophie Beaupère and Unicancer, we launched works on, a, on an ecosystem as, as a third party uh, trustee in the centers. And the dynamic is moving forward and is going to acquire a new, it's going to get to a new step, a new force at the European regulation level, which will uh, enter, will be enforced in 2025. And so it's not only in AI and health. Uh, information of the patient on resorting to AI in the care and human control, not always, on samples according to methodology that will be built with the same level of financial section than the GPRD. So 80% of, 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 of turnover. A last word. In a singular fashion, this European framework that is powerful doesn't position France on over-regulation because the FDA took to, uh, took this principle as well. This is the question we ask. Isn't it at a Frankenstein of AI, this human guarantee, with this obligation, which is possible at the start, maybe that difficult, difficult in real life, in the maintenance of, of this mechanism. To, you have to scale it in the, in the dental uh, system. We have a lot of hindsight after three years. It has been subjected to control, and the corrective decisions hasn't changed uh, a lot on the system itself, but on human practices with the need of, of retraining. So the human guarantee allows us to, for it to be adjusted to a human system. And so you prevent, you warn your patient that you use AI. It, it might uh, surprise many patients have, have want. They come because there's AI. Even though, honestly, it doesn't allow to improve the quality, it saves time. It doesn't improve, for now, the quality. Patients, paradoxically, are, are, are not reluctant, uh, are not, uh, don't have mistrust. It's, it's a point of attractivity for the doctors, yeah, for, for, the, for the caregivers. Uh, on, this, on this human guarantee uh, level, um, do you think this regula European regulation that you ex David explained to us, is it, is it the, the European wisdom that speaks or, or, is, or is it being naive compared to American players that took part of it, or the Chinese who, who are elsewhere? I'm ambivalent. I'm a doctor, but I'm not in charge of a, of a company that that wants to resolve, that wants to bring tools to resolve doctors' problems. Doctors always always used innovating innovative tools and methods, equipment, and now it's AI. You have to, to realize of something very important. AI in Europe is always uh, a medical device, a medical apparatus, uh, level two. 
So if Europe is wrong or France is wrong, I, I want to tell you, I have European regulation that is very strict on medical apparatus, medical device. It's it's something we can wish for. And, and we are submitted to a lot of complexity, but there's a form of regulation. And AI is going to add on top of it in health, not only in health, but in health uh, uh, added conditions. And that's something that that, that, that um, prevents innovation and, and allows us to, to find a good a right balance. But it, it might prevent innovation. The worst thing that, that could happen is that we don't move forward. It's desirable to have AI, but other people move differently from us. But on the French aspect, and I express myself with, with, with David, I'm terrorized when I hear we invented a new thing in France, and in the law, there's a human guarantee, but not always, but sometimes. And I hear a little bit when we talk about health data. Yeah, wait, we house the data here. We host the data here. But we can have the, the hosting of the data of biology that we're going to do differently. And we're going to have to, to go back to technology to conform uh, to French regulation for sovereignty issues and that we are not able to make evolve. So I wanted to say, if we get so a little hindsight on regulation and what is being done in, in Europe and the US, the Americans have already have an attitude which evolves much faster than, than the Europeans in the context of AI. You have the MDR and AI Act, and the Americans now have set up fast tracks on algorithms to be able to validate quickly algorithms that are more advanced. And an issue that we don't want to see in Europe is to keep old versions of algorithm. We know that uh, they're outdated, but for industrials, it's too expensive to, to go through the whole uh, system mechanism. So an example, in the US, the whole symbolic AI that Stephanie mentioned earlier, model based on explicit knowledge, and not, not a black box, but explicable models, all these things are not considered considered medical devices because American regulators consider that there's a benefit, superior benef benefit to apply simple uh, control of the humans regarding uh, comparison to complex algorithms and apprenticeship-based algorithms are considered medical devices by the FDA. A last point in, in, as a provocation, do we use human guarantee on humans? I'm a doctor. I discovered by creating a company that there was regulation, management system, quality management systems, and I didn't understand in the hospital what was the quality management system in the hospital that guarantees that humans looked what other humans did. In this case, shouldn't we hu human <laughs> create a human guarantee for humans? Don't give us ideas in this room, please. Stephanie Alassonia. You work in fundamental research on AI. <coughs> what will be the next waves? So we talk about the AIs, AIs we know. There are new other generations of AI that will uh, that will be called on. To and what is the future in this domain uh, in terms of mistakes and, f and 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 the concerns for tomorrow? I think that we got to a point, and specifically, particularly with the new mod models of language, ChatGPT, that, that revolutionized and upset uh, the whole landscape of knowledge for, for, the, for the public at large in AI. We, we got to, to a stage where the apprenticeship uh, phase is well known, but with a huge database. At the start, we had symbolic AI, where you don't need data. The apprenticeship, statistical apprenticeship learning, where everything can be explained. There's data, but we don't need a lot. But we put a lot of mathematical constraints, and so we need less information from from the data. The the model for, from based on deep learning, the mathematician is in the backdrop and lets the machine modelize, and we need a big flow of data. And that's ChatGPT that took on loads, millions of, of, of text base. And the idea is to have equivalent performance with less data and networks and, and mathematical structures are finer linked to apprenticeship, deep learning and mathematical models to reduce the size, the quantity of data necessary. It will be a frugal uh, AI. So we are in medicine. It's one of the main challenges because we rarely have the ability 
even if I put all the medical reports that Pompidou has next to the one, the whole uh, uh, Paris hospital uh, system, uh, even that will, won't be necessary to have a, a chat GPT equivalent uh, from scratch. It wouldn't be enough to match, to, to get to the performance of chat GPT. So we're going to have to be much more intelligent, mathematicians, to, man to be able to modelize, introduce information, mathematical concept to get to frugal uh, AI. And to bounce back on what has just been said, what's going to be necessary and also to reassure populations on the use of, of all this. We're not going to burn the Amazon, the rainforest when, when, when we do one thing, but we're going to, we're going to uh, be frugal with energy. We're going to have, there's going to be a lot of acculturation and adaptation and everyone. Uh, not just training future doctors, uh, engineers, uh, to the problem, to the issue of, of uh, health data. Everybody's going to have to be informed. And so, in the end, the notion of, of human guarantee, it could go through an acculturation, a global acculturation. And I join I, uh, what Arnaud has said, inform the patients that we're going to use AI you never went to a doctor who's going to tell you, be careful, I'm going to use my stethoscope <laughs> and add an old tool because the stethoscope is better. AI is the same. Don't stigmatize AI. You have to manage that to end collective conscious. People have understood what it does. People have, are conscious that, yes, it can get it wrong like anything, but the doctor knows it. He was trained. And and we'll have sufficient uh, hindsight. When we're going to get to the frugal AI, we'll be more explaining, we'll be helped to, to train and to inform. To synthesize, to, I'm going to conclude before leaving you the, the last word. AI can get it wrong, and so what? So what? Because it gets it wrong much less. And it was reminded. Uh, I wouldn't want to forget to, to elude the question when AI gets it wrong, and I'm, to conclude, I'm going to ask you all four, what is the, your worst nightmare? David, my worst nightmare, the Netflix of AI in health. Think about it. Look at the curve, the way in, in which things uh, move. And it's, it's wonderful. Technology develops. But we're a few months to, to, to see an extra-European platform that will distribute algorithms against a few 10 euros without intermediation by a health professional. And we have to be ready by keeping human at the heart of the mechanism. It's not a luxury, it's a necessity to adapt to the mechanisms to make it compatible with innovation. It's positive regulation, it's a good thing because you have to get ready by 2025. We, but it's tomorrow, we have some time, but it's tomorrow. My night, nightmare is not so far from, from David's beyond the economical aspect to have a American or Chinese players that will distribute that model. The pure medical aspect, if these models are developed on American population and Chinese population, but not valued on European populations, it's not going to work as well. And so concretely, the loss of, ch of, 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 of opportunity by using these algorithms when they don't work well for us. And so beyond the economical aspect, think of, of public health. The conclusion for us, for me, is don't uh, prevent the use of these tools, but we should look into thinking of developing them in France and Europe. My nightmare is that we end up at Sham in a few years, and and, and, and we and think oh, we were we were on a good start to to do AI in France and Europe. To uh, but we're going to do the new th thing after, but that we lost the, the, the previous generation because the perfect system that everything is French from beginning to end, that we're in this culture very, that's intellectually very, uh, very fruitful, <laughs> that things come from the outside because we missed that train again. And I think it's still time, but let's be careful. Uh, uh, I think with AI, we shouldn't have the same thing happen on relevance and quality. Thank you.